Hi, I'm Cheryl Kagan, very proud to be the Senator for Gaithersburg and Rockville. Welcome to this episode of Kibitzing with Kagan. With me today is my very good friend and former House colleague and former Secretary of Transportation, Bob Flanagan. Bob, thank you so much for taking the time to chat today. Thank you. It's great to be with you. Thank you. So I've got a lot of questions for you, but let's start long, long ago with your career in the Navy. Tell me something that you learned in the military that helped guide you as a political leader. Well, I, uh, I think that uh, it really uh, was significant when I became Secretary of Transportation. Uh, the skills that I learned when I was 22 years old, uh, leading uh, men who uh, knew everything about the submarine, and uh, I, I had to rely on them, uh, but I had to give them, uh, you know, affirmative guidance and, and uh, uh, help them make things happen, do their job. So really that was the situation at the uh, Department of Transportation. There were people who really knew their job. And uh, what I knew was uh, I worked for Governor Ehrlich and we had certain visions and they all helped me pursue that vision. Great. Let's, we're gonna get to Secretary of Transportation a little later, but let's talk first. Um, you went to Harvard, you went to Cornell Law School. What inspired you to get involved in politics and what made you a Republican? <laughs> well, uh, first of all, my dad came down from Vermont uh, and worked for uh, US Senator George Aiken. Uh, you have to be pretty old to remember George Aiken. <laughs> He was a great public servant for uh, decades. Um, I asked my dad very early on because he had friends who were Democrats and Republicans and I didn't seem to notice him, you know, making a big difference between them. I said, you know, what's the difference between Republicans and Democrats? And he said, um, you know, really the most important thing is a person's character and, uh, when I deal with somebody, I, I want to know if they have a good character, and I don't really care whether they're Republican or Democrat. That's great. And what inspired you to run for office? Well, I, I think it might have been a little DNA. I know my father had always wanted to go back to Vermont and run for office. I never got a chance to do it for a whole bunch of complicated reasons. Uh, my my brother, my younger brother, as you know, was a an elected official in Vermont. He was yep. a Democrat. He was very liberal Democrat, even by Vermont standards. Yeah. He was like in the uh, Bernie Sanders orbit, so to speak. They were they were counterparts back then. Let's um, honor Let's honor Edward for a moment. Uh, the former watchdog, uh, the equivalent of our state comptroller, and a senator, and a good guy. Yeah. Yeah, he was, in fact, he was um, uh, he was the state auditor, which is an elected position in Vermont, and he was the first openly gay statewide elected official in the country. So in the country, that I don't remember. Cool. The entire country. So yeah. it was at a time where it was very risky to yeah. uh, come out and announce your... Uh, your I remember that. Uh, so... You served for 20 years in the House of Delegates as a Republican, and you were also minority whip. Talk about what it was like to be in the minority party in Maryland. Is there um, a time when you thought that it really made a difference? Um, a story you want to share? Sure. I think uh, the point where there was clearly a difference was uh, after the, um, like I'm just, uh, I think it was the 1994 election, I think, uh, where- uh, That's when I was elected Sauer, to the House. Ellen Sauerbrey almost yep. beat uh, Paris Glendening. It yep. was a very controversial result. Yep. Um, and Ellen ran on a promise to reduce income tax. And lo and behold, uh, before the next election, Paris Glendening came out and supported a reduction yep. in income tax. And oh, by the way, uh, it was like a, a percentage decrease was the first proposal. 
And uh, uh, the minority leader, Bob Kittleman and myself said, no, that's not fair. Half of that should go to the, uh, to the individual deduction. That'll mean everyone will get the same dollar amount rather than giving the tax cut all entirely to the, the more wealthy people. So that's how the bill ended up. There you go. Um, and let's remember Bob Kittleman, our colleague, uh, who was a wonderful statesperson and whose wife, whose widow serves in the House of Delegates now as a Republican representing Howard County and whose son served as um, County Executive of Howard County. Exactly, did yeah. a great, wonderful job. Great family. Um, so, before we get to, uh, before Secretary of Transportation, you've been a lawyer and you've had your own private practice. Um, it's a challenge both for time and conflict of interest. Why don't you talk about how you did that balance and how you continue to serve your constituents while also serving your legal clients? Well, so before I was elected, I had been involved, uh, I had uh, been with uh, big firms in Baltimore, uh, but after I was elected, uh, it really made sense to open my own law practice. I didn't want to have to worry about some client of, of a partner uh, that maybe had an interest in, in the legislation and where would I be if, if I was uh, some financial benefit. Whereas mm -hmm. if I had my own law practice, I knew who my clients were. I knew if there was or was not uh, a conflict and generally I had a small companies and individuals. And so I, I avoided those conflict of interest problems. Good Time management, it was, it was, uh, there were some stresses. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah, I understand. Yeah. Uh, again, one more thing while we're talking about the legislature. Um, you and I are friends, like really friends, even after yeah. you left office, friends, and after I left office. Uh, talk about bipartisanship, talk about um, how that how that can work, how that did work when you were in office? Well, it can work. Uh, another good friend of ours, uh, uh, um, uh, who was uh, subcommittee chair, uh, always would comment to me uh, that, Bob, he said, you really, we, we do a lot more bipartisan work on the subcommittee and then when we get to the committee, there's a balance. There's some bipartisan work and there's some uh, sort of political posturing, if you will, on both you're sides. Talking about, you're talking about appropriations or judiciary? What are you talking more, about? More appropriations. Yeah, that's a, what I uh, The largest time was the 12 years that I spent uh, right. on the appropriations committee. Right. We served uh, on subcommittee together on appropriations for about 10 minutes before the chairman, you know, <laughs> I acceded to my request together. and moved me, moved me away. Um, and then when you get to the floor, uh, things are pretty much baked and people have uh, generally some form of the leadership, whatever that is, of the majority party has right. decided what they want to do. And uh, at that point, it, it's easier to sort of draw the line and say, well, we don't like what you're doing and here's why right. and, and make an issue out of it. Right. So Governor Bob Ehrlich uh, was elected and uh, made you his transportation secretary. Talk about that process. Is that something you campaigned for? Why that, why that role? What made sense about that for you? Um, why don't you talk about that for a little? Yeah, so um, look, as you know, in politics, relationships matter. When I first um, came into the legislature, uh, I was on the, the uh, Judiciary Committee. With, as with a, Bobby as Ehrlich. A, as with Bob Ehrlich uh, and Mike Bush, by the way. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and we were all freshmen and we all got uh, along together and we became good friends and went through a lot of battles together. Uh, so getting back to how he became Secretary of Transportation, uh, you know, the governor knew that I was 
supporting him as, as governor. I'd always been you know, very close to him. And he asked me to consider what I might like to do in this administration. Well, the, the other part of the story is that I had been on the subcommittee that did the transportation department budget for mm -hmm. four years. Uh -huh. And so I felt I knew it pretty well. And I, and, uh, I knew that it was a great job. Uh, I can tell you another sort of side story about how great a job it is, if, if you want to get into that. Go for it. Was Peter Franchot your subcommittee chair when you were in No, no, no. Uh, um, Maloney. Timmy Maloney. Wow. The... Okay. Before my time. Yeah. So um, the, the secretary who was in the administration after Ehrlich, huh? Beverly Swain Staley. Uh-huh. Okay. Uh, told a story recently. We we had the uh, 50th anniversary of the Department of Transportation, nice. and they invited each of the former secretaries. We all each got to say a few words, and her comment was that the only person who ever had both jobs, the job of being governor and the job of being uh, Secretary of Transportation, was Harry Hughes. Right. And when she was sworn in, Governor O'Malley appointed her. She asked Harry Hughes to hold the Bible and sign uh, over the swearing in. And at that point, he told Governor O'Malley, he said, look, I, I've been governor and I've been Secretary of Transportation. Best job is Secretary of Transportation. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and as, as Beverly said, I, I, I love the story, but I wish he hadn't told me. <laughs> <laughs> so I briefly, uh, I read Governor Hughes's autobiography, which I love, and I sent him a note, which he responded to, and he invited me to lunch at his home. And I was so delighted for the opportunity to spend a couple hours with him before we lost him. Uh, yeah. He was quite an elegant man, and he was the first governor that I really uh, knew and respected and got to work with. Quite a story, quite a yeah. career. Yeah. Truly. So what was your biggest accomplishment and your biggest challenge? Give me one of each, if you would, as Secretary of Transportation. Well, uh, the challenges always came in uh, <laughs> uh, I, for the, from the Board of Public Works. Okay. So, um, so for those it, who may it, not know, the Board of Public Works is a three-member body that is the ultimate decision maker on contracts, and it's the governor, the state comptroller and the state treasurer. So, uh, Governor Hogan, or Governor uh, Ehrlich, and former Governor Schaefer were very close, and they were allies on the Board of Public Works. Mm -hmm. So, uh, if Governor Schaefer had a point of view, I was all ears, right? Uh, it, it was. And Schaefer at that time was state comptroller, correct? He was state. He had the vote. Yeah. He had the swing vote. Yep. So uh, I'm not going to get into any specific details, but that uh, that could be a little bit prickly. Um, I'm sure. Uh, but Governor Schaefer was always fine to me and, and respected what we did, but uh, there was some sensitivity there that I had to I had to show. Okay. The ICC was was and for for decades uh, a very contentious issue: the intercounty connector. Yep. Uh, connecting I-270 and I-495 with an east-west toll lane. Why don't you talk about the ICC and uh, your role in it? So uh, that was uh, Governor Ehrlich's number one priority. He campaigned on it. Uh, he probably uh, got more than his fair share of criticism for being all in on the uh, ICC. Uh, but he made it possible. Uh, uh -huh. It in in the years leading up to his election, it was destined to be an abandoned project that never was going to happen. Uh, it had been in planning for thirty five or forty years. Yep. Uh, as uh, Governor Ehrlich uh, used to joke, uh, we found the sign uh, on the ICC corridor in the woods that said, uh, you know, vote for Nixon. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But he did me the favor, and this is sort of a leadership tool, okay? Uh, 
he and I remember specifically a speech be, uh, in front of the BWI uh, partnership, which is Baltimore Washington Airport. Mm -hmm. Big deal, very powerful group of constituents. And uh, Governor Ehrlich uh, introduced me as Secretary Bob, if you don't build the ICC, you don't have a job, Flanagan. <laughs> well, I mean, that was very true. Mm -hmm. uh, because you know what? Uh, the people that work for me, who are all well-meaning, okay, yes. got the signal uh, that, uh, well, they didn't have to like me, but but uh, where, where the governor stood on the issue, right. where I stood on the issue. Yep. Uh, and, and we got it done. And it was uh, thanks to a lot of uh, really good people uh, in the department, yeah. uh, in the State Highway Administration, uh, who, who and worked the with environmentalists. And in the legislature. And the legislature. So from my, from my very first race, um, I was always pro-ICC because, and as a Democrat, and as an environmentalist, it made no sense to me that my Gaithersburg and Rockville constituents would have to sit in traffic all the way down 270, around the Beltway and up 95, if they could just cut across. And uh, uh, so I was a strong ally. And uh, so thank you for doing that. Well, and I think we were able to work with the environmentalists yeah. and, and really satisfy some of their uh, concerns and avoid void problems, uh, uh, fix problems and, and where we couldn't, uh, we found ways to compensate uh, for problems. So right, right. It, it, so, it was done, a lot of good people worked on it. Yes. So we are now dealing with, and by the time this gets aired, we will know how Comptroller Peter Francho votes uh, on the three member board of public works. He is the swing vote on the Hogan proposal to widen 270 and add very expensive toll lanes. Anything that you learned or anything, I don't, I know you're not probably watching all the details of that, but any thoughts on that uh, public private partnership proposal? Well, yeah, let me tell you, uh, like I said, we had the 50th anniversary of the Department of Transportation and all the, the living secretaries were there, okay? Mm -hmm. We all, as a result of some conversations, we all signed a letter uh, in support of the project. Okay? Mm -hmm. um, and gave it to Greg Slater, who I'm sure was very happy to receive it. Well, and, and put it out in the public for, mm -hmm. for public uh, education, I think. I mean, our area, looking to the future, that is, we, we are going to become, we are becoming a megapolis, okay? Washington, D.C., Virginia, Maryland. We are going to compete in, the, in future years for jobs, uh, businesses, uh, prosperity, quality of life. As we did with and, Amazon. Yeah, and, and, and this project is needed. You cannot have that bridge. Anyone in, in Montgomery County who, who goes over to Virginia knows uh, they don't know what they're going to get in, in, you know, or they're going right. to catch a plane. They've got to add what, a half an hour, not knowing what the traffic's going to be like. Then they're done that. I agree that there are problems. I'm just not sure that this plan is the solution, but I don't want to go way down that <laughs> Um Talk to me. Uh, mass transit is something that we all want to succeed. We want Metro to increase its ridership post pandemic. Um, any thoughts or tips to people or policymakers about how to increase the demand for mass transit? Well, I don't know about the demand because it really that seems to me to be uh, a sociological issue coming out of the pandemic and people's willingness to get on a get on a subway. It's going to happen. I mean, we are going to, you know, it may be a year, a year and a half out, two years even out before people start living their lives normally. I wish it was tomorrow but I'm yeah. not in control of that. And I don't see anybody else in con who can tr control it. Yeah. But the issue is uh, a couple things. One, um, every time you have a, a 
you've got to be realistic about transit, what it can and cannot do, okay? Uh, it, there's a limit to getting people out of their cars and into transit. And you've got to be realistic that you're still going to have people who need to travel on the highways. Okay? Right. Um, the other part of it is we are on the, on the edge here where technology is going to change transit immeasurably, just like it's going to change everything cars that you drive sure. in. Okay? But I think, I think transit can move faster in terms of uh, what we call driverless cars, uh, you know, cars run by computers or technology. I mean, but that's, that's coming and it's probably right now the state of technology in those pods, those electric vehicle pods is sufficient that we can, like for example, uh, the quarter city transit way could be could use that kind of technology, and and sixty percent of the cost of operating transit is personnel. Right. Uh, you wouldn't be taking anybody's job away from them because you'd be creating a new right. new corridor, and you could make it a lot more feasible budget wise to do it. Okay. Uh, let's pivot from policy to politics. So really, talk about, I, I never thought we would talk I about know, that. imagine that. So talk about your views on Donald Trump. Uh, Donald Trump uh, almost destroyed our democracy. Uh, if, if he had had his way, we would not have a real constitutional government. Uh, you know, December 6th was the ultimate. I mean, I, I really, I saw it coming a long time ago. But, uh, yes. You're talking about January 6th, the interaction. I'm sorry, I, I said December 6th, January 6th. Yeah. 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 Yep. Yep. Uh, this is a softball question. Who do you believe won the election of 2020? I'm gonna like am I guessing or are you allowed? <laughs> are you allowed to say that? I'm just I'm not sure about that. Well, I mean, um, uh, you know what? I mean, uh, uh, it is it's not negotiable. I mean, uh, Biden won the election. Uh, now, Biden won the election. Period. It's just not right. Move on. <laughs> so. So sometimes there are some Republicans who want to stay inside the party and fight from within. And there are some who have switched party registration to Democrat or, or unaffiliated. Um, which do you think is the more effective route to make change? Well, I, time will tell. I, I, don't, I don't know right now. Um, but we have to have a two party system the electoral college system uh, really mandates a two-party system. Okay? Uh, and so I don't see any other party right now except Democrat and, and Republican. Okay. So uh, whether you stay out of the party and you nip at the heels and threaten to form a new party, I mean, okay. But I... I I'm, beginning to hope that the Republican Party will sort of morph into recuperate. A, a, a re recuperate. That's <laughs> good. Uh, okay, looking forward. Uh, give us your take on the 2022 gubernatorial election, both the Republican primary, the Democratic primary, and the general election. Well, first of all, I never... I never hazard a guess about what would happen in a democratic primary. I mean, I'm happy to respond to specific people, but uh, first of all, if there was somebody I would support or think would be the best candidate, my mentioning it would only hurt them. So, okay, <laughs> like, 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 it's not in, in my perception of the best interest uh, to do that, okay? 
Uh, Kelly Schultz is really an excellent candidate. Um, I don't see right now. Um, I mean, we're right waiting to see if Michael Steele gets in the race, but I haven't heard from him. And for the time being, I'm assuming he's not going to get in the race. And the other people uh, are just not viable candidates or, or viable governors. For the record, Delegate Dan Cox has uh, launched his campaign and he was there at the Capitol on January 6th and tweeted that Mike Pence is a traitor. So he is definitely a Trump acolyte. And then former Lieutenant Governor Michael Steele and former, as, and former Republican National Committee Chair Michael Steele um, has launched an exploratory committee. And the question is whether he'll decide to officially run or not. Um, so interesting. Okay, so last thing before we get to Fast Five, Bob, you were a very, are a very loving and devoted dad to two dynamic uh, women, girls, uh, and helped raise them. Anything you wanna share about uh, what, it's, what it was like as a, as a single dad raising daughters? Well, uh, actually three daughters. Three daughters. Uh, my oldest, Kate, my Claire, oldest. And and Betsy. Betsy uh, oh, I don't is, know. Uh, yeah. That's right. Yeah, uh, works at Twitter and lives in San Francisco. Uh, uh, she's more apolitical. Well, I would typically, historically, she was apolitical, but during the last presidential candidate can campaign, she would call me on a very regular basis, worried about, you know, are you sure that Trump can't steal the election? Right. And I would have to try, try to make her feel better. Right. Uh, uh, but um, but Kate and Claire, Kate is uh, just uh, uh, took the bar exam. She's got a clerkship with with a judge in uh, in, in Oregon, Oregon, Portland, Oregon. Uh, she uh, took took did did a very nice job in law school and gonna. You know, have a great legal career ahead of her. And uh, Claire has gotten her master's in education. She went back to school to get that. And she's going to start teaching math in uh, middle school. Best so I've got- Best parenting tip? Oh dear, parenting tip. All I can say is I, any, I warn any younger parents, your children will surprise you. Uh, and it's a good thing. You just have to learn to accept it. That's cool. All right, Bob Flanagan, your fast five. Uh, five questions for brief answers to allow folks to get to know you better. You didn't tell me about this, okay. You didn't read the memo or watch any other episodes, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> so episode, uh, question number one, what is your favorite quote or motto? Um, it, the, the short one is, um, it's out of Sir Thomas More. Uh, don't chop down all, all the trees to get at the devil because where will you hide when the devil turns around and comes after you? Wow, cool, okay. Uh, question two, who is your favorite author? Um, Shakespeare, I go with Shakespeare all the time. Okay. What is your favorite dessert? Uh, bread pudding. <laughs> wow. Oh my God. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. That makes you even more, <laughs> okay. Boring. More bland, right? <laughs> that is so bland. You are way more interesting than that. Um, question four, what advice would you give to a young person who's just thinking about getting involved in politics? Um, well, it, depending on how young they are, I would say, look, uh, demographics means an awful lot to your political future, and you need to pick a place to settle down in and participate in that fits your particular point of view. Hmm. Okay. Uh, the last question, Bob Flanagan, former former member of the House of Delegates, former Secretary of Transportation, my good friend. 
What is your hidden secret talent? What is your superpower? Something that you're good at that most folks can't do. Oh dear. Um, well, I, I don't know if it, it's not political. I mean, I, um, I've been working uh, over the last several years on uh, cases involving uh, domestic violence against children and women. It's a passion of mine. And um, I think I've learned a lot about the, the weakness of our system and how it doesn't provide adequate protection to, to, to women, usually women and, and children who are involved in that situation. And your superpower is protecting them, advocating for them? Uh, so far, yeah. Good. Well, I know about that. And I know that at least one or two cases have been ongoing for years and years and years. So thank you for your persistence and, uh, and your unflagging advocacy for it's those It's a big families. deal, the big yeah, deal. Absolutely. And it's, it's not one or, I mean, for me, it's one or two cases, but for yeah. society, yeah. there's, there's a lot out there that goes on that where we leave people unprotected. Yep, yep. Well, Bob, thank you so much for taking the time. Mr. Secretary, Mr. Delegate, uh, my friend, Bob Flanagan, great kibitzing with you today. Stay well, stay safe. Look forward to seeing you soon. Bye. Thanks, Senator Kagan. Bye-bye. See ya.